Hi, all. It's uh, Rick Bassman here from Maui with Talking Tough. And uh, one of those same built-in excuses that we often have, we just had a storm low and hard about 10 minutes ago. They took down our connectivity. I am hoping that we stay up and, uh, and running today. We've got a very special guest. I'll bring him on in a minute. His name is Nate Boyer. For those who are, and we've got about half an hour only today. So this is going to be a little different for us. You know, we should get deep in uh, with, a, with a longer conversation. Also, I always, almost always know my guests well. I've never met Nate before, nor did I get to talk with him to prep it all in advance. So we're going to shoot from the hip. Uh, this guy's a renaissance man. I, I know that he's done a million of these things, so should be smooth and easy. So, so who is Nate Boyer? Normally, we would ask our guests to get really into that, and we'll do some of that. But because we're limited on time, I want to do a quick intro of my own uh, through my research. I, you know, we launched a show back in March, and I made a hit list right away of people that I wanted to have on the show. So I did a lot of research far and wide. And, and as you know, we've had some pretty unusual, out there, amazing guests on this show. And mostly what we aim for amongst those unusual, out there, outlandish guests are guests that you know really have it together. People that have faced down a lot of stuff, risen through adversity, and keep being strong, strong people during these increasingly challenging times. Nate Boyer was, first of all, and I'll, and I'll always be a huge fan for this, he was an Army Green Beret. That in and of itself is enough and, and special enough for talking tough, certainly. But here's a guy who decided early in his, or mid in his life, or maybe even later, he'll tell us that he wanted to play football. He didn't play as a kid. He didn't play in high school. He walked on to the Texas Longhorns, one of the top teams in the nation, made the starting squad, then what went and got deployed again to Afghanistan, came back, started every game for the rest of his career, then as a walk-on in the NFL, became the, I believe, oldest rookie ever in the NFL. Uh, there's a lot more about Nate. We'll bring him on in a moment to get into that. I think that's a great start. Uh, it's my pleasure to finally welcome to Talking Tough, a guest we've been chasing since the beginning, since last March, Mr. Nate Boyer. How you doing, sir? Appreciate you. Oh man, likewise, Nate. Thanks for uh, making the time. I know we're uh, we're short on time, so I, I guess we'll just uh, we'll dive right in. Let 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 me ask you quickly because I know a lot about your history. What are you up to presently? Well, you know, I, I uh, was fortunate enough within over the last five years to uh, to co-found a charity with Jay Glazer um, that's called Merging Vets and Players uh, MVP for short. We bring together combat vets and former professional athletes and help them find purpose, uh, identity, uh, that service, and and uh, you know the, the locker room again when the uniform comes off. All too often, both veterans and athletes, um, you know, they they struggle with that transition. You know, as, as I did as well in, in different ways. I was lucky to have football to kind of hold into after the military, but you know, it wasn't without its challenges. That's for sure, and. Uh, you know, so through MVP, um, we've we've uh, we've opened up chapters in Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Chicago, New York, and uh, Atlanta. Um, this last year, this year during the pandemic, actually, uh, I directed a feature film about the genesis of MVP. Um, and so we, you know, we made it for no money, or in, as far as Hollywood goes, no money. Mm -hmm. um, but it was incredible, man, and people like Michael Strahan and Randy Couture. And uh, Jay Glazer and, and uh, uh, Tom Arnold and uh, Tony Gonzalez, all these athletes and actors um, stepped up and, and were willing to help us out and give some of their time and make, you know do some cameos and whatnot. And we had about half veterans on the cast and crew, so it was a really cool project to get done. And you know, I'm in, in the middle of uh, post production right now, but we're you know we're getting there. I think it's something really special that we have. So we'll be able to. I lost you there. There we go. The storm. It's the Maui storm, man. Um, oh, man. So that's crazy. To to the movie later. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it's crazy, man. You got some storm connectivity issues out there, man. That's, I mean, it's Maui, though. You can't complain too much, but, you know, I bet it gets crazy. No. It's a great place to live. It really is. You know, we're, we're up here isolated in what's called the upcountry. We have no neighbors, uh, very little kind of uh, 
services of any sort up here at all. It's a beautiful place to live, but it's oftentimes like living in a third world country. So, uh, you know, you take you take the bad with the good, and it's mostly right. good. So I'm not complaining. So we'll be able to see the movie later this year. Then um, I'm not sure about later this year. We'll see. It's just you know, post production is taking longer than expected as well because budget limitations, but also just with everything going on, you know, it's it's uh, it's hard. It's hard right now. It's a weird time. Uh, Wait, so there's so, something going on, and there's there's a weird time. All right, man. I want to I want to ask you about how <laughs> how you deal with what's happening right now, because I, I read and I, I don't want to dwell dwell too much on the following. And I'm sure you're tired of it. You, you have an association to Colin Kaepernick. Uh, he and I'll just tell it really quickly for the people that are not initiated. He obviously sat out a game in protest. You were asked by the Army Times to write an article about it, but instead wrote a letter to him. And if I get this wrong at any juncture, please jump in and interrupt me. I want to I want to be sure. And the open letter caught his attention. He then wanted to meet you. You guys met. And I know that you you had some, I say have some words, the wrong way to say it. You got along fine. But I know you didn't necessarily agree with his position. I don't think you agree with it at all. Because I, I know you're, you're a patriot. You're, um, you're, you're, you're an army ranger. I, I know that you support everything or most things the country stands for, I'm sure, and the flag stands for. But you suggested to him a way he could participate that might mitigate some of the the response that he was getting. How, with a guy who was so patriotic, a guy that comes from the army, how do you put what most people's reaction to that would be aside and engage with somebody like that to try to find a middle ground? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it came from uh, an understanding that uh, you know, my, my relationship to the flag, the way I perceive things, um, the way I feel about it, my emotions, they're all related to my experiences, you know, what I went through, um, what I saw, uh, what I fought for. And those are great things. I'm proud of those things, but it's, it doesn't mean that they are the only way to think and that they are right or wrong or anything like that. Right. And, uh, you know, I worked with a lot of people overseas in Afghanistan and Iraq that I, didn't agree with in a lot of ways, you know, fundamentally, culturally, customarily, uh, things just, uh, sometimes you just have to let that stuff go and, uh, accept people, you know, and understand that, that most people are good people and they're just trying to do the right thing in their eyes and what they think is right. And we all have different ways of going about that. And sometimes I get offended. I get hurt by things that people say and do, but you know, I can't let that control my life and control my emotions. I can't let them, you know, I can't let that power over. Uh, take me over. So, you know, I wrote that letter, Colin reached out because in the letter, I basically just said, look, this is why, I, this is why I feel the way that I do about those symbols. But I also fought for your right to do what you're doing. You know, all of us took the oath to defend the constitution, which includes the first amendment. So it's not about me liking it or agreeing with it, but it is in my opinion, at least about me, um, I guess, respecting your right to do that, regardless of how, I took it, you know, how I perceived it. And uh, he reached back out to me and wanted to meet. So we met before their final preseason game that year in 2016, down in San Diego in the lobby of the hotel about four hours before kickoff. And we talked for a couple of hours and at the end of the conversation, you know, and it was a good conversation. He just asked me if, he, if I thought there was another way he could, uh, he could demonstrate that wouldn't offend people in the military. And I said, no, <laughs> there's nothing you're going to do that's not going to offend some people, you know, and that's just the truth. Uh, I said, but, if, you know, if you're committed to not standing, which he'd said adamantly, um, I think to me sitting on the bench isolated from your team isn't super inspiring. I I, I would I, I think the best move for you, in my opinion, would be to, to, the most important thing, I guess, is to be alongside your, your teammates. And if you're committed to not standing, then I think taking a knee is um, the only other thing that maybe makes sense. And I think kneeling is a form of sign of respect. Um, and, you know, it's your choice. And he did chose not to do it. I said, you could put your hand on your heart. You could bow your head. You could look up at the flag. You could do whatever you want. But, like, you know, I think that that at least shows that you're willing to give a little and take a step. And, and so he did that. And I think the context of that and that story kind of got lost over the last few years. But, you know, that night when he did that, I stood next to him with my hand on my heart, um, sort of signifying that, 
I'm here with you and with some of the stuff that you're saying and what you're and what you're demonstrating for, I don't disagree with. I mean, I want this place to be a better country and a safer place. And um, but there's certain things that you know he says and does that I don't agree with, and that's okay too. Um, but I can still have the conversation. We can still have the conversation, listen to one another, and uh, and really try try to find a common ground and uh, work together towards uh, making this place better. You know, we can't uh, we can't just do away with everything. You know, we've got to just restructure things and fix things that are broken. And it's just like a sports team. You know, when, when somebody's when you have a, when you have a cancer within the team, you either got to cut the cancer out or you got to fix that person. You know what I mean? And that's the same way with a lot of the systems in our country. We have to we have to fix them. We have to approach those things together, though. So so you you know I want to come back to that in a second for sure. Uh, you took a guy or got with the guy whose position you absolutely did not agree with, and you were not only cool about hearing him out and while, while not agreeing with him, you were you were very cool about it. Not only accepting his position, but helping him improve it. I think that's an amazing lesson for for everything in life, as you were just saying especially with what's happened this past week, this past few months. What, what what are your hopes for our country over the next few months? It's oh, a big man. broad question. I know that. Yeah. I, I'd love to hear off the cuff what your thoughts are about that. Well, you know, for all of us, for all of our sake, I really hope, you know, these vaccines and everything work out and we get through this time. Because I know that's – I'm not saying that's causing everything, but it's not helping. <laughs> it's a very – it's made it a very tough, uh, almost a year now. Um, you know, but I also, I also hope that we can all take a step back and, and settle down a little bit and enjoy, uh, enjoy our families and our friends and be good to ourselves. And then when we, when we talk to those neighbors that we don't like or don't agree with, we can do it with a kinder heart. And, uh, we sort of, I hope it's, I hope this last year has been a big wake up call. Um, for the country and then we can somehow get over this division and start to come back together again. I mean, I remember how unified we felt after the tragedy of nine 11, you know, and uh, you know, that's a great feeling. And I miss that. I think a lot of us miss that. The ones, those that remember it anyway. And, uh, but all these things are happening for a reason because something's not right. You know what I mean? I, I don't think it's just arbitrary. Uh, I really don't believe that. And, and, uh, and I think so it's necessary. It's necessary, you know, like growth, when you work out, you know, you tear your muscles so that they can repair and grow. So like there, there is an element of like that needs to happen um, in some way uh, for us to grow. I think that's just the way that is. It's uncomfortable. I, I agree and, with you completely, you know. man. And I think we know, you know, guys that have been through a little bit of stuff like you have, like, like I have, I think. I, I, I think we all come to the realization at one point or, or another Everything does happen for a reason. Uh, I'm dying to see when the dust settles, what the reason has been for this. Maybe healing the racial divide. Who knows? But it's going to be something big, I think. Are Are you optimistic that we're going to head back in the right direction? <laughs> yeah, I am optimistic, uh, and I'm a pretty. Pe I can be a pretty pessimistic guy. You know, I think that goes along with another point about this next year. Uh, including myself, I need to be better about this is like just being better to ourselves. You know what I mean? Not being so hard on ourselves all the time and, uh, and understanding that we're not perfect. It's okay. Like we're, we're all a little bit broken. We're all a little messed up. We make bad decisions and life's just hard sometimes. It just is. And that's okay. Like accepting that it's really hard to do, but accepting that and understanding, believing that you're still a good person, you still have value. Um, and you're going to come out of this. That's a hard thing to remember, but I think, that reflects a lot uh, outward. You know, how you feel about yourself inward reflects a lot on how you treat people outward. And I, I hear and feel all this anger um, from people. And I think a lot of it comes from, from dislike for oneself. Uh, agreed. And, and I, think you, I think you have the magic answer. You're good to others. You help others. Be of service, whatever we call it. That, that's the way through to me. And, and I believe that's part of the message I'm, I'm getting from you. And on that note, if you wouldn't mind, I don't know what the confidentiality issues are or whatnot. Is there a, like a great success story from MVP that you like to share? Yeah, we have a ton of them. <laughs> you know, I was actually just talking to Glazer a little bit ago about it. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think just the, just this concept, like for instance, for instance, even with the movie. So when MVP started, we, 
I was down at a, a veterans uh, shelter, um, like a transition center, but it is technically a homeless shelter uh, on Sunset Boulevard in East Hollywood, and you know, not the not the nicer part of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all Iraq and Afghanistan veterans that are in this place. Uh, unfortunately, they shut down not long ago, but we were allowed to film there for the movie before they did. Um, and there's 48 bunks in there. They're always full. And not only had so many of the people that had been through that place come through MVP, been part of our program, but they went on to, you know, get jobs and get out of there and, and, and uh, you know, and live in their own place and start their lives over truly like, I don't want to say complete that transition because I don't think we always do, but at least start it. You know what I mean? At least like believe in themselves again and understand their worth and their value. And these things they did overseas, even if they're really um, seemingly horrible sometimes and, and very challenging to get over. And, you know, you have the survivor's guilt uh, or whatever your trauma is. Um, you made it back. And in, in our opinion, you owe it to those that didn't make it back. Uh, to live a great life, you know, there's survivor's guilt, but there's also survivor's responsibility, you know? So, so it's up to, it's up to us to like, I think a lot of, from a veteran community standpoint, to lead a lot of this country back out of the hole that we're in, but also follow your dreams, man, follow your American dreams. And uh, that's what those guys would want, the ones that didn't make it back. And the ones that are struggling right now, they need to see that as well. So we're all helping each other by doing that. And so that's not really an individual one, but that's like, there's countless stories like that. You know, people that have, they had childhood, uh, childhood sexual trauma, horrible stuff, reasons they ran to the military, you know, to get away from that life, from that childhood. And then they get out and they're right back in that circumstance, right back in that neighborhood. And they don't know what to do or how to start doing it. And they don't even know what they like. And uh, so like, that's, that's part of what the program offers because it's just a network. It's just a community that we're building. It's these, we're, we're all coaching each other up. Like I don't have the magic words, you know, I don't know what the answer are. I'm trying to figure them out every day too, but we're there for one another. And when you get these big groups of people, you know, 50, 60 people in these meetings training together and then coaching each other up when we're all exhausted on the wrestling mat later, um, it's, it's super valuable. You know, we get so much out of it. Um, just, just hearing each other's stories and hearing what worked for one another. And, you know, if I'm having a bad day or going through something tough and I'm willing to lay it out there on the mat and share it, you know, there'll be people in that circle that'll just be like, Hey, this is what, this is what I did when that happened. And I can relate in this way. And it just, you know, number one thing is you don't feel alone. And, uh, and beyond that, you just know, um, that you that and other people have been through this too, and they survived it. So you can do it as well. Sure. So you you're, you have your hands on on things quite literally. You're really really in the mix yourself. First, you were, you've been doing a lot of wrestling. Did you uh, <laughs> did, did you get on the maps with uh, your your fellow uh, army vet Randy Couture? Yeah, I uh, I have before, and uh, go for it didn't go very well. You know, he was in his, you know, he's in his mid fifties now, I think. And he still throws people around, you know, he's a, he's amazing. But Randy's a great guy. He, he sort Randy, of Randy's an old, old friend. As a matter of fact, I managed his op opponent in his uh, mixed martial arts debut at UFC 13. And uh, oh, he killed my guy, my six foot, five inch, 300 pound, crazy looking monster. He beat him like <laughs> in 40 seconds, but it's all good. Yeah. That's good, man. He's yeah, it was funny. He was showing me a few things, and the minute he felt me just a little bit trying, he he made sure I knew that you know he put me in my place right away. Made sure he, I knew he was messing with. I was like, okay, all right. You know, it just, it just it was just a simple little shrug, you know, kind of throw, and you know, I was he's, off balance like that. You know? He's a world class guy, and that and that yeah. just he is a great guy. He is a what, great what guy. What was your what was your specialty in uh, in the Green Beret? Uh, I was a communication sergeant. So it was like sat satellite communications, you know, kind of handling the radios and whatnot. Uh, you cross train and everything, you know, and I think, I personally think the medics were the most badass. They had so much more training than us uh, as far as the schoolhouse was an extra six months long. But also just, you know, there's a lot riding on that. You have a lot on your shoulders, a big burden, you know, sure, as a medic, sure. as a combat medic. Um, but all the, all the MOS is the engineers and the, and the weapon sergeants as well. Uh, and then obviously your Intel guys and, um, you know, your leadership, it's, it's, it's all really cool. I think combo, I, I probably had the easiest one, you know, I mean, you can always just blame the atmosphere when the radio is not working. You know, you can't really do that when a gun's not working or somebody's bleeding out, you know, you don't, you can't make excuses like I could. So. 
Um, but I, always made, I tried to make sure everything was working properly and fix okay. it when it needed to. But. Well, here, here, here's a funny kind of kind of Green Beret related question for you. So we, we have a guest on Talking Tough next week. His name is Robert Vecino from Vivos X. It's the far and away the world's largest Armageddon prepper outfit. They built like these multi-billion dollar shelters under the ground uh, all over the world. And they're convinced the world's coming to an end. At least our business model depends on it. What um, what, what what's what's your plan? You're optimistic things are going to work out. If it doesn't, do you guys have a plan? Nope. <laughs> Man, I, gonna, I was ready to. Hear I'm going to adjust. I'm going to adjust. Army Green Beret plan. No, nope, I don't have one. I mean, I'm armed. Uh, <laughs> you know, I I, I don't know. I I, uh, I think I'm just gonna adjust as we go. I don't want to, I don't want to just you know, I don't know, head for the hills or anything. But I also like, I also want to like help fix this thing on the ground. I want to be boots on the ground as well. But right if all goes to hell, I feel like I'll, I'll be able to figure it out. You know, you'll I mean, be okay. I'm sure. I'm sure you're gonna be one of the resourceful ones. I have a little doubt. Are, yeah, are you in? Uh, are you in Los Angeles these days? Yeah, I am. I'm, I, I I am in Los Angeles. I'm. Going to be splitting a little bit of time with here in, in Austin, Texas, though. Uh, but yeah, I'm out here. And why, why, why Los Angeles? Well, I came down here after uh, college. Actually, I actually lived here a little bit before the military as well. Um, I lived in San Diego and LA after high school. Um, but uh, yeah, then went into the military and then um, joined the or sorry, came up to yeah, joined into the military and then went on to University of Texas and played football. And then came back out here to finish my uh, master's degree. I did an internship with Peter Berg, who's a filmmaker. He did, you know, Friday Night Lights and Lone Survivor. Oh, Peter. Sure. Yeah, yeah. He does a lot of sort of action, uh, um, military-related, often sports-related uh, projects, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it kind of made sense for me just to learn the business, you know, the nuts and bolts, um, sort of the behind-the-scenes development side of things if I understood the content better, you know, I, I thought. And so it made sense. So I finished that out here and then I started training at Jay Glazer's gym, Unbreakable Performance Center. And, uh, uh, you know, I was training there with hopes of getting a shot in the NFL. And, um, and Jay helped me out quite a bit, helped me get representation and was in the ear of every head coach and GM in the league, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and I got, fortunately, I had a, a couple of offers um, from the St. Louis Rams at the time and, and the Seattle Seahawks uh, on the last day of the draft to sign as a free agent. And I, I went with Seattle because they'd been to back-to-back -back Super Bowls. And I figured, you know, I was a Green Beret. I got to go for the toughest uh, challenge here. And uh, so I went up to Seattle and was fortunate enough to play in one uh, preseason game. But as you said earlier, it was incredible. I mean, I was 34 years old and, and I was the oldest guy on the team and I was the oldest rookie in NFL history, at least in the modern era. So, wow. That, and, and is that a distinction you still have, oldest rookie? I think so. I think so. Awesome. That's Thirty-four is pretty high up there for the NFL. So you, uh, so you kind of had, and I don't, I don't need to make light of it at all. I think it's amazing. But you kind of had your Rudy moment where you got to suit up and get on the field and the whole nine. Yeah, percent. yeah. I got to play. I played the whole second half. I mean, I was a long snapper, so you don't play that much anyway. I think I was only in five or six plays, but. Um, no, nah, but it was awesome. All my snaps were great. Nobody blocked any kicks. So that's a win. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just was a matter of, I mean, I was not the biggest guy, uh, by any means, certainly not the fastest guy or the most talented. Um, but I worked my ass off and, and got it and just got a shot, got an opportunity, you know, and that's all you can really ask for. Can, can you relate to, and, and I know we're getting close on time. So I'm, I'm cognizant that we do need to wrap up pretty quickly. But can do you relate to the movie Rudy? And I asked about it again only because everybody knows that movie. Everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I grew up a Notre Dame fan. I mean, I, I was from the Bay Area, so I was a 49ers fan first. Joe Montana went to Notre Dame, and Notre Dame was always on TV every Saturday. So I just became a Notre Dame fan because um, at the time the local teams weren't very good. <laughs> it was like Cal and Stanford, and they just weren't very. They weren't great. So uh, I so I, so I pulled for Notre Dame and. Uh, a lot of my heroes came through Notre Dame. And so then when that movie came out, I think I was probably 12 years old or so. Uh, I loved it. You know, I just love the I, I love the underdog spirit. It's a very American thing, you know. Um, 
for us to we, we we pull for our underdogs. It's not like that in every part of the world. And, 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 and you thing. you were that, and you accomplished some incredible things. And you're in LA. You know, you obviously know how the business works. Is, yeah. is there a like a Nate Boyer life story in the future coming to the small? Uh, world <laughs> I still got to live it. You know, I'm not done living it yet. <laughs> All right. Um, no, I, I, not, nothing's in the works. No. I'm sure you're pretty well connected in that world, uh, the unscripted world and whatnot. Yeah, it was. <laughs> you know, I was actually hosting a show for NFL Network that was like an Anthony Bourdain style show. Uh, we did it for two seasons, but we didn't do it this year because of everything going on. And so I'm hoping we can pick that back up next year because I love that stuff. It was just going around the country, meeting different people uh, in different NFL cities and, you know, hearing about uh, different social projects they have going on. A lot of them social justice related. Uh, specifically in light of everything that had been going on. So, um, you know, I'm hoping I'm hoping we can get back to doing more of that. It was cool. It was fun. Maybe we can make it a little more fun next time and, and uh, you know, kind of keep, keep keep bringing people together while uh, sharing different viewpoints and experiences. That That's a, that's a great mission, man. I want to – I'm keeping the eye on the clock for you, so I know it's time for us to uh, get ready to say goodbye here. Where Where can people go to support MVP – or or anything else you would like people to be aware of yeah um go to vetsandplayers.org uh that's for the mvp website um or just google mer merging vets and players and check us out um you can follow me if you'd like at, at nate boyer 37 on twitter and instagram um you know this i'm wearing this t-shirt for a specific reason um a buddy of mine who was a marine in, in 27 which was a battalion that got hit really hard on back-to-back -back deployments in 08 and 09. And they've lost, I think, close to 50 men uh, to suicide now uh, since 2010 from that one battalion, which is crazy. Um, but Trinidad is his name, Trinidad Garcia. And he started a, a, je a jeans company called Trinidad 3, a denim company. He went from the Marine Corps to fashion school because he was in love with denim and that's what he wanted to do. A very outside the box path. Um, but, you know, happy to say that, that, we just got into Nordstrom recently, so we're, we're available on, on Nordstrom online. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 everything's made in the USA and, um, you know, it's all, it's made by vets, you know, vet, vet owned and operated. So I just think it's really cool. There's a lot of great veteran owned and operated businesses out there and companies. I just, I know Trinidad really well through MVP. Um, I know his story really well and I've seen the man at work and it's just, it's awesome stuff. So I, I had to be a part of it, but, uh, anyway, hey, something where do we look that up what's the uh, what's uh trinidad three jeans they're on instagram at trinidad three jeans um i believe the website is trinidad three.com it might be trinidad three jeans.com i don't want to screw that up um but if you google once again if you google trinidad three jeans um and when we uh when we post this we'll put all the links up ourselves awesome. as well so we'll Beautiful. make sure people see that well nate in about half an hour we talked about um the end of the world we talked about bringing <laughs> people back together football wrestling fashion design <laughs> um, I, uh, I wish we could have had more time, hopefully another time in the future. Yeah, let's do it thank again. Thank you very much for coming on, man. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate you, brother. All right, Nate. Likewise. Hope to see you again soon, man. Keep talking tough. <laughs> you got Peace, brother. <laughs> and we're still here. Do I have John Pozorowski, John Paz, or Rachel Sartoris, or both of you around? Our producers for talking tough. Yes, there's here, John. Here. Looks like Rachel's there too. Yes. What do you guys think of Nate? I wish we had, had longer with him. There's a there's a big story there. It sounds like. Yeah i I think he's he's great. He's got a lot of, you know, inside. I think he's had you know a lot of great experience. I think he has a lot to give back. I think there's, you know, with everything that's going on with vets and service members after, you know, before and after they leave the service, uh, particularly as it pertains to mental illness uh, and the support they need and what he's trying to do to give back, uh, I think is amazing. He just seems like a really good, solid, genuine guy. That that's what, and I agree with everything you just said, absolutely. But the the personal side of it, I just I like the guy. That's always, always nice to uh, to meet someone like that. Yeah. John, how about that walk on story, man? 
Makes me want to like go join the ATP and walk out to Wimbledon next year or something like that. Yeah, it's crazy. Thirty four in the NFL is pretty old if you think about it, because rookies usually in the NFL are twenty two or twenty three, and your lifespan as a football player or your career as a football player usually is between like three and five years. Usually, for a lot of players, uh, it's less. So, I mean, think about him being 34. I mean, he's definitely oldest rookie ever. And obviously, without, you know, without even playing high school ball. That's yeah. crazy. Yep. Sounds yeah. like um, Brock Lesnar as well, who, who kind of just did that, but he wasn't as old, obviously, as, as Nate was. But it's one of those things like, wow, what, he just wanted to do it and went and did it. What a great well, story. He, you know how we learned? I, I wanted to bring this up. We were so tight on time. Do you know how we learned to play football? No. By watching YouTube videos. Wow, that's weird. Interesting. That was crazy, right? Um, you know, because I was, uh, you know, I'm not very good at researching our guests, but this one I did research, and uh, I, I saw that um, everything he does, or most things he does in life, he, like, studies it intently on YouTube first. That's pretty crazy. Wow. Well, Yeah, I mean, know, even I, players I, that I, have oh, long oh, careers? <laughs> Even players that have long careers by, you know, thir- between 32 and 35, that's usually when they're at nearing the end of their careers for a player that has a long career in football. I missed all that because my dogs are barking. John, did you get it? Yes. Yeah. 100%. 100%. By 32, 33, 34, even 35, your NFL career is for sure oh, winding down. down. Yeah. I mean, that, that's like the tail end of someone who has, you know, a long career in football. You know, you're, you're pushing the, you know, Tom, Tom, Brady, Tom Brady's, the, you know, Emmett Smith's, Out, the Jerry outlier, Rice's. Sure. Yeah, the, the people who have super long careers, that's like the tail end of their careers. Well, yeah, so, Tom Brady's also like, the six hundred million dollar amount, you know, six yeah. million dollar amount adjusted for inflation. Of yeah, course. exactly. Yeah, that guy exactly. does everything a human being could do to better a human performance. It's incredible, man. It's just, I'm sure you know about that probably more than I do. And uh, anyway, God bless Tom Brady. I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, guys, we got a couple of trippy guests coming up that I'm really psyched about, and uh, let's um, let's figure out how to make these killer shows um you know we booked uh uh john rachel and i spoke a bit about it earlier we got a confirmation from isaac wright jr today and uh we're gonna we're figuring out a time for him next week isaac wright is the gentleman who um inspired the hit abc series which is now on hulu called for life about a guy who was in prison for life uh and wrongly convicted and while in prison studied to become a lawyer got his law degree, was able to get a retrial, and got himself freed. And uh, that's Isaac Wright Jr. He's in New York now. He is declared as a candidate for the mayor of New York City. And uh, I'm really excited about that one. And uh, as we were discussing earlier, John, if he wins, we we got a friend in high places, man. So let's make this a good one. Yeah, let's hope he wins, too. Yeah, that'll be a good guest. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. And then... uh, and then the guy I mentioned to um, to Nate there, uh, the on the opposite end of the spectrum, um, Mister Armageddon. You think, <laughs> it's wild. You got to look this stuff up if you haven't yet. This guy, he's a billionaire. Uh, his name is Robert Vasios. He's he's a, a verifiable billionaire who started this company, uh, Vios X. Vivos X, yeah. and they bought up, they went around the world and they bought up all these government installations where there's one in uh, Germany, one in Russia, a bunch here in the US, where they have huge underground, like nuclear proof and disaster and end of the world proof bunkers. And then they've retrofitted them to make them like luxury accommodations. And these guys are like preparing for the end of the world. And John, the guy is six foot eight, three hundred pounds. With a quick note, as a side note, could have been a pro wrestler, but um, we have him on next week as well. So that should be. Uh, we should have a couple of good ones coming up here. Yeah, wide, wide, and interesting range of people. 
which is which is great. It's fun. Yeah, it keeps it keeps it interesting, definitely. Well, guys, yeah. uh, I just wanted to say hello. Thanks for uh, as always. Thanks for putting it together. Yeah, and happy uh, to be here. Onwards and upwards. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. All right, hey everybody, Rick Bassman here on Maui signing off on behalf of our producers, Rachel Sartoris in Los Angeles, John Paws of the Two Man Power Trip on the eastern half of our country. We had Nate Boyer on today and good stuff coming up. Please follow us on YouTube. The address is right here on the bottom of the screen. Follow us on Instagram at Talking Tough Pod. And we'll see you next week.